Hello friends and welcome again to another edition of 3ABN Sabbath School Panel. My name is Ryan Day and it's always a blessing each and every week to have you study with us. And this quarter as we have been making our way through a study on the great controversy, each and every one of us here on the panel have been tremendously blessed and we know that you have as well. And this week we're taking on Earth's closing events. We're getting into some deep prophetic study, which is one of my favorites. I love Bible prophecy. And uh, before we go any further, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our Sabbath School panel. To my left, we have Pastor James Rafferty. Good to be here, Ryan. I have Monday's lesson, which is entitled Sealed for Heaven. Amen. Praise the Lord. To your left is Pastor Johnny Dinsey. Thank you. It's a blessing to be here. I have Tuesday, Whom Do We Worship? All right. Praise the Lord. And over to your left, we have Dr. Professor Theologian Daniel Perrin. <laughs> Thank you. It's Wednesday. I have the early and latter rain. Oh, exciting. Praise the Lord. And of course, last but not least, Miss Jill Marconi. Always a blessing to have you. Thank you so much, Ryan. Glad to be here. On Thursday, we look at the loud cry. All right. Praise the Lord. Like I said, we're getting into Bible prophecy and I'm going to be covering Sunday's lesson, which is entitled Loyalty to God and His Word. Uh, but before we dive into our lesson study, we want to remind you how you can get a copy of the 3ABN uh, notes. So the 3ABN Sabbath School panel notes, that's each and every panel member uh, from week to week prepares notes. And uh, we all prepare notes differently, but nonetheless, you can have access to those notes if you send us an email requesting a copy of the notes. And so that email address is ssp at 3abn.org. Again, that's ssp at 3abn.org. Just send us an email and say, hey, I want a copy of those notes and I love Sabbath School panel. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Let's go ahead and have a prayer and then we'll get right into our study. Daniel Perrin, would you have a prayer for us, brother? Our loving Heavenly Father, Lord, we've got some topics from your word that you've placed here for us right before us and you've given us the Holy Spirit to help our minds to focus on the truth and to be able to express it in words that will resonate in the hearts and minds of those listening and watching today. I pray that that will be true by your strength and grace. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. You know, I loved uh, the story uh, that, that Sabbath afternoon had to tell, or at least the illustration. I thought it was very fitting for what it is we're going to be discussing this week. First, I want to read the memory text, which comes from Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 23 from the New King James Version. It says, buy the truth and do not sell it. Also wisdom and instruction and understanding. The lesson says, suppose you had a teenage daughter driving home from college for summer vacation. As you wait for her to arrive, you anxiously monitor the weather reports. You become worried as the weather rapidly deteriorates. Storm clouds loom on the horizon. Winds blow fiercely. The heavens open and rain pours down. Trees are blown over. Soon the main road home is impassable. Then you hear from one of your neighbors that it is possible to get through on a secondary road. Cars can navigate around some down tree limbs. Although communication is difficult, you are able to get a text message to your daughter, carefully detailing how she can get home safely. More than anything else, Jesus wants to take us through the storms of life and get us home. That's what the whole Bible Amen. is all about. In fact, Mrs. White writes in Testimonies for the Church, volume 8, page 315. Uh, she says, a storm is coming, relentless in its fury. Are we prepared to meet it? The purpose of Christ's life, death, and resurrection, and ministry in heaven's sanctuary is to ensure that we get home. The prophetic messages of Daniel and Revelation are divine instructions, especially for an end time people to help us through life storms that one day we can feel the warm embrace of our loving Savior. The aim of this week's lesson is to reveal what the prophetic word says about the closing events and discover anew Christ's strength to, Christ's strength to take us through earth's final conflict and to get us home. I'm homesick. I'm ready to go home. And in order for us to get home, Sunday's lesson tells us we must remain, as it says, loyal to God and His Word. Of course, Sunday's lesson entitled Loyalty to God and His Word. And of course, we're going to be jumping right into some text that will help amplify and support uh, this concept. Of course, we read our, our memory text already. I'm going to read it again from Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 23. It says, by the truth. Does truth come at a cost? 
I think it comes at a cost. And it certainly comes at a cost in the sense that we must surrender all that we have in order to not only obtain, but of course, live out that truth in our life. Of course, the gospel is free, but yet it comes at a cost. Jesus wants our sin. He has paid for those sins. But if we give him our sin and we give him ourselves and we place self up on the altar and we surrender our lives and our will to him, then he will freely give his righteousness to us. But the text goes on to say that once we buy the truth, it says, do not sell it and wisdom and instruction and understanding. John chapter eight and verse 32, we're familiar with this text. It says, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free or set you free as some versions might say. And then of course, Jesus says in John chapter 17 and verse 17, it says, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As I was studying this lesson, all I could hear were the words of Pontius Pilate to Jesus that day as he was standing on trial, as his life was hanging in the balances and he was about to go to the cross. And what did Pontius Pilate ask him? He said, he asked him, what is truth? And we seem today to be in a world and in a society that is also asking that question, but also answering it in a very convoluted and uh, unbiblical way in the sense that many people live in their own world, in their own, uh, uh, in their own reality, their own false reality. We live in a world today where people say, I have my own truth. And of course, there is no uh, objective truth. Everything is relative. Everything is subjective. But yet in the word of God, we know that if we live in the reality of our creator, the Bible makes it very clear that the only truth that matters is his truth. You know, the word deception appears in the Bible more than 70 times. Let me take a few texts here and this you'll see just how important this was to the Lord and how he shares his heart on the issue. Matthew chapter 24, verses four and five. Of course, not once, twice, but three times in that chapter, Jesus warns of deception. And he says in verses four and five, he says, take heed that no one deceive you for many will come in my name saying, I am Christ and will deceive many. Right there in Matthew 24, verse 24 and 25, he says, For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. And then he says in verse 25, See, I have told you beforehand. Christ says, Remember my words. Remember I've warned you of this that is to come. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 6 and 7, Paul writes, Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. We don't want to be sons of disobedience. We want to be sons of obedience, sons and daughters of the Lord, obedient to our master. Colossians chapter two and verse eight says, beware lest anyone cheat you through. And I like these words here because it really summarizes the times in which we're living, these last days, these closing events. It says, beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit. There's a lot of philosophy and personal ideologies that are floating around out there that people want you just to accept just because they said it, but that's not necessarily the case. It says, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. And then of course, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 26, he writes, these things have I written to you concerning those who try to deceive you. So deception is very, very much uh, on God's mind in the sense that he's constantly warning us and saying, do not be deceived, do not be deceived. Awake, make sure that you are grounded and rooted in the truth of my word, that you're loyal to the truth in the last days. And I ask the question here, uh, or I make the statement here in my notes here, one must have a love for truth. Many people say, well, Ryan, there's so much truth out there. Why don't people just receive it? Uh, well, there's a few reasons why people don't receive truth. And one of them is that you must have a love for truth in order to see and accept truth. If you do not love truth, well, then when the truth comes, you're not going to see it. You're not going to understand it. You're not going to perceive it. And you're not going to be willing to receive that truth that has been come to you. And so notice what 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 10 to 12. Again, the prophetic words of Paul here as he's writing about these last days in which we're living. He says, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish. Because why? Because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. He says, and for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure 
in unrighteousness. Mm -hmm. And also tie that to 2 Timothy chapter 4. Paul had a lot to say on this because Paul uh, in his missionary journeys and throughout his life was given many different visions and understandings of what would transpire in these last days that we're living. And he says in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verses 2 to 4, those famous words, he says in verse 2, preach the word. Mm -hmm. I love that. Preach the word. Be instant in season. And I'm reading this from the King James Version just because I like the wording. I think it's, it's more solid in its understanding. It says, be instant in season and out of season. That means be consistent. Don't, don't go over here and believe and profess one thing to this group and then come over here and profess and believe a completely different thing. Paul says, be consistent. And then it says, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. And then he gives this prophetic uh, message for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears and they shall turn away their ears. Here it is again. Notice the theme from the truth. They're turning their ears. They're turning their eyes. They're turning their minds away from the truth and shall be made unto fables. And again, I ask the question, you know, why does it seem like so many people cannot see or accept plain truth? When I was coming into this truth and the Lord was showing me all of these amazing truths that I believe today, it was a journey, of course. I'd, I didn't accept it all at once because it was a process. It was a journey. Uh, but nonetheless, I, when I saw it, I believed it and I accepted it because it was in the word of God. But I often found myself as I was sharing these truths and sharing it out of love and sharing it because I cared about my fellow man and I cared about my friends and I cared about my family members and I wanted them uh, to know the truth. And I, I probably didn't always use the right witnessing techniques in the beginning, but my intentions were pure. I, I always was wondering like, why can't these people see the plain truth in God's word as I see it? It's right here. The Bible clearly says it, but yet people were, are, are very blind to the truth or they simply don't believe it. And then, of course, there's a biblical answer for this. Many people say, well, it's there, but why don't they agree with it? Why don't they see it? And Jesus answers it in Matthew chapter 13. He says, he speaks to the disciples and says, therefore, I speak to them in parables because notice, speaking about the people of his day, the, those that were uh, somewhat spiritual degenerates in the sense that they had closed their eyes and closed their ears. He says, seeing they do not see and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. And in them, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, hearing you will hear and shall not understand and seeing you will see and not perceive. And the question is, why? Is it because God's hiding the truth from them? Absolutely not. We know God is not the author of confusion and wants all to come to salvation. But verse 15, he answers the question. He says, for the hearts of this people have grown dull. It's a personal decision. These type of people, they've allowed their hearts to be hardened. He goes on to say their ears are hard of hearing and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, he says, so that I should heal them. My friends, don't harden your heart to the truth. Mm -hmm. You have to have a love for truth. Sometimes the truth comes and when you find your life not in harmony with it, I know it's difficult to change, but Jesus never asks us to change uh, that's not for the better. So if you're in a situation today where you're struggling to receive truth, be loyal to the word of God and allow the truth to be solidified in your heart and mind. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Ryan. We're just going to pick up right where Ryan left off. We're going to go to Ephesians chapter one. We're talking in this week's lesson, uh, Monday's lesson about sealed for heaven. My name is Pastor James Rafferty and Ephesians chapter one, beginning here with verse 14, actually verse 13, in whom also you trusted after that you heard the word of truth. Mm -hmm. Ryan was just telling us the word of truth. After you heard the word of truth, uh, the gospel of your salvation in whom after that you believed you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So one of the difficulties that we're facing, especially in these last days, is that God actually wants to seal us for heaven. And the way he seals us is through the truth. And of course, the sealing is the Holy Spirit. We're sealed with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is directly connected to being sealed into the truth. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more. But first of all, we want to talk about what the Bible teaches concerning the seal of God. Because in the coming crisis, it's going to be over worship. And God's faithful people, and I'm reading from the quarterly now, Monday's lesson will not yield to worldly pressure. That's what we're told, Revelation 14, 12. They're going to keep God's commandments and keep the faith of Jesus. They will be sealed by the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 4, 30, and cannot be moved. In ancient times, seals attested to the authenticity of official documents. 
They were a distinctive individual mark. Since the final conflict centers on worship and God's authority as revealed in his law, we would expect God's seal to be embedded in his law. And you can look at uh, Isaiah 8, verse 16. So in Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11, we have the fourth commandment. That is the center of God's law. It's right in the middle. And the fourth commandment actually contains the elements of a seal. And there are three elements that we want to bring out here. First of all, the Lord thy God. That is his title. The Lord thy God. Oh, excuse me. Let me, go, let me go back here. The first element is the name to whom the seal belongs. The Lord thy God. So that is one element of a seal. Whenever you have a, a document that is sealed, you're going to have in that seal who that document belongs to or, or who that seal belongs to, where that authentication comes from. In the Sabbath commandment, we have the Lord thy God, which tells us where this uh, authentication comes from. It comes from God. And the second part of a seal is the title, the one who made or created the heavens and the earth. So in the Sabbath commandment, you have remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. So we have the seal represented in the Sabbath as identifying his name and identifying his territory, his, or excuse me, his title, and then his territory, who made the heaven and the earth and the seas and the fountains of waters. So this is why we see in the Sabbath commandment a direct connection to the seal of God. But James, you just said that we're sealed with the Holy Spirit. You just said that it's the Holy Spirit that seals us, not the Sabbath. Well, this is a conflict that a lot of people struggle with because they're not recognizing the connection that we've already talked about between God and His law. Mm -hmm. See, the law of God is a transcript of His character. It's not some uh, outline of do's and don'ts that's separate and independent from God. It's a transcript. It's a revelation of His character. God is love. Mm -hmm. And so the law of God being a transcript of His character, we can expect that within the law of God, we will see a revelation of who He is. He's the Lord God, the creator of heaven and earth. We also want to recognize that the Holy Spirit is God. So if we're sealed with the Holy Spirit, we are sealed with the law of God, which is a transcript of the character of God. Mm -hmm. So there's no contradiction here between being sealed with the Holy Spirit and the Sabbath truth because the Sabbath is the center of God's law, which is a transcript of His character, and the Holy Spirit is God. Mm -hmm. All right, so as we go on now, we want to direct our attention to Revelation chapter 7. Revelation 7, verses 1 and 2, talk about an angel that comes from the east having the seal of God. It talks about the four winds of strife being held back and not blowing on any tree or on the earth or the sea until the servants of God are sealed in their foreheads. That's Revelation chapter 7, verses 1 and 2. And then it describes in verses 3 through 8 the sealing of God's servants that is symbolized, and I want to emphasize that, symbolized by the 12 tribes of Israel. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason why that's so important is because a lot of our evangelical friends will say, well, this is literal. These are literal Jewish male virgins that have never slept with a woman, the woman that are being sealed here. And of course, that's a whole different topic. But the reason why we understand that there's, it's symbolized here, well, there's many reasons, but here's one. If you look carefully at the tribes that are sealed, you're going to notice that they're not the same original 12 tribes that are outlined for us in Genesis chapter 49. They're not the original 12 sons of Jacob. Actually, one of them is missing and another name has been put in its place. And if you study this carefully, you're going to realize that that's because the seal of God is all about character development. It's not just about going to church on a certain day, even if it's the right day, and not going to church on another day because it's the wrong day. It's about character because the seal of God has to be placed in our foreheads. We want a character mm -hmm. like God's character. We want the character of love. And so when you look at the seal of God here in Revelation chapter 7, God is communicating a mysterious truth. Mm -hmm. Now, why, what's a mystery? We identified this a few studies ago. The, um, the, maybe it was on a quick Q&A, but let's just simplify it right here. A mystery is something that, that God has to reveal to us that's not yet known. But God wants to reveal it to us. Mm -hmm. So when you look in Revelation chapter 7, the tribe that is missing is the tribe of Dan. And Dan is described in Genesis chapter 49, verses 16 and 17. He's described as one of the tribes of Israel who will judge 
the tribes of Israel. That's what the word Dan means, to judge. Now, Danielle means God is judge, right? But Dan means to judge. So he, he is a judge. And then in verse 17, it says, he bites the horse heels. He's an adder in the way and a serpent in the path that bites the horse heels so the rider falls backwards. Mm. Dan's character is not sealable. Dan is a judge. He's a backbiter. He can't be sealed with the seal of God because the seal of God is a revelation of his character. And God is not an accuser like Satan. He's not a backbiter. He's, he's not judging us in that negative sense. He's judging us through Jesus Christ and his righteousness. So then we see a replacement in Revelation chapter 7 because there's still 12 tribes that are sealed here. And the replacement is Manasseh. Now Manasseh, according to Genesis chapter 41 and verse 51, was the firstborn child of Joseph. Joseph, who was sold into slavery by his brothers. Joseph, who was, who was abandoned by those who should have protected him or were closest to him. Joseph, whose church members sold him into to slavery and abandoned him. That Joseph, who, when his son was born, said, I'm going to call him Manasseh because the word Manasseh means causing to forget. Mm. And he said, God has caused me to forget everything my brothers did to me. He's caused me to forget all of that. So what you see here, because the, the, the foundational word for Manasseh is actually to forgive, mm -hmm. to forgive. God is calling us into this character development that causes us just to forgive those who hurt us the most. Mm -hmm. And that's what we see here as a powerful lesson in Revelation chapter 7. And why? Because we're going to need that. When we get to the final crisis, we're going to face opposition that is going to be overwhelming for us. In fact, when you think about this in relationship to a statement I want to read to you from 5T, it's going to be a powerful or excuse me, a difficult, uh, 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 a difficult challenge for us to stand in this time. Mm -hmm. The statement goes, to say, goes on to say this, already the judgments of God are abroad in the land as seen in storms and floods and tempests and earthquakes and perils by land and by sea. The great I am is speaking to those who make void his law. When God's wrath is poured out upon the earth, who will be, then be able to stand? Now is the time for God's people to show themselves true to principle. When the religion of Christ is most held in contempt, when his law is most despised, then should our zeal be the warmest and our courage and firmness the most unflinching. It goes on to say this, to stand in defense of truth and righteousness oh. when the majority forsake us, to fight the battles of the Lord when champions are few, this will be our test. At this time, we must gather warmth from the coldness of others, courage from their cowardice, and loyalty from their treason. The nation will be on the side of the great rebel leader. That's 5T, page 136. Now, just, just break that down for just a second and think about it. This statement is not talking about other people. This statement is talking about the would-be Josephs among us. And it's saying, when your brethren forsake you, when your brethren turn you over, when they sell you as a slave, when they, when they discard you, the people that are closest to you, that's when you need to gather warmth from their coldness. That's when you need to gather courage from their cowardice, right? This is when God wants us to stand for the truth. And are we developing a character? Are we allowing God to seal us with his character, the character that he has, the character that would not let us go, that did not count heaven a place to be desired while we were lost, the character of Moses and the lamb, the character that is going to be the song that we're going to sing. Are we developing that kind of character? God is going to allow us to be tested day by day, week by week, month by month. Little tests are going to come that are going to develop that character of gathering warmth from the coldness of others. May we be faithful to those tests. Amen. Amen. Praise God. All right. I'm loving this study already. We're going to take a short break. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Ever wish you could study more deeply along with the three Abian Sabbath School panel members? Well, now you can. Just send an email request to ssp at 3abn.org and we'll email you the Sabbath School panelist notes on a weekly basis to enhance your own study of God's Word. That address again is ssp at 3abn.org. We'd love to send you their notes just as they've prepared them. Thank you for watching and thank you for being part of our 3ABN Sabbath School panel family. Hello friends, welcome back to 3ABN Sabbath School panel. We're going to pass it on to Pastor John Dinsey for Tuesday's lesson. 
Thank you, Pastor Ryan. We are now on Tuesday and the title is, Whom Do We Worship? And this is a question for all of us. This is a question you should ask yourself, whom do you really worship? And in the lesson, I like to read from there, it says, in the last days, the great controversy will be played out in a dramatic way over worship. Do we worship the creator or do we worship the beast and its image? There is no middle ground. The first angel of Revelation 14 urges men and women to worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water, Revelation 14, 7. In further support of heaven's appeal, the third angel reveals the dire consequences of worshiping the beast. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, Revelation 14, 10. By contrast, those who worship the Creator are described as keeping the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, Revelation 14, 12. Let's move on to Revelation 4, 11. Notice here, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they exist and were created. So God asks his children to worship him because he is our creator. And God doesn't force anyone to worship him. God invites you to worship him, gives you reasons to worship him. And he, he wants you to worship him in spirit and in truth because you love him and you appreciate all the things he has done for us, especially that Jesus Christ died for us to rescue us from the penalty of sin. In Daniel chapter 7, verse 25, we have the following words. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and law. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time, and times and half a time. We have talked about this in previous lessons, but here we bring out that he shall speak great words against the Most High, but also seek to change times and laws. And specifically, when you look at the Ten Commandments, you notice that the Fourth Commandment talks about a time of worship, that we should worship the Lord and remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. We are called to have a holy convocation on the Sabbath day, that is Saturday. We keep saying the Sabbath day, but it's Saturday. It's, that's what it really is. But you know, I, I say this because in Spanish, Really, when you look at the Bible and you look at Luke chapter 4, verse 16, and it says, and Jesus went in the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. In Spanish, it literally says, and Jesus went into the synagogue on Saturday and stood up to read. So there's no, there's no confusion in Spanish. In English, you have the word Sabbath and the average individual out there doesn't know, Sabbath, what is, what is that? I only know of Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. So we have to specify the seventh day. And now there is this confusion being brought about because many calendars coming, coming out in print or digital, you see the first day of the week is Monday because that's the first day that people start working, first day that people start going uh, to school. And then you look and wait a minute, Sunday's on the seventh day, how can that be? But really, when you start listening to people in church and they say on Sunday, uh, some say, well, isn't this a beautiful Sabbath day? And it's Sunday. But it's really the first day of the week that uh, Sunday is. And now we move to Revelation chapter 14, verses 9 through 12. Here we have the following words. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, if anyone, notice, worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or, in, or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. So you have some forcing going on, some threatening going on to worship the beast. God doesn't threaten anybody. Right. He says, worship me because I am your creator. And so he, God informs you of the danger of worshiping the beast and his image. 
And notice the contrast once again, as mentioned before. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Wait a minute. But aren't the Ten Commandments done away with? Why is it talking all the way in the last book of Revelation that people are keeping the commandments of God? And if you notice in Revelation chapter 12, the devil goes to make war against those who keep the commandments of God. Well, why is he doing that? Is it because they're doing something wrong? No, it's because they're doing something right. And he's not happy with that because the people that uh, keep God's commandments recognize God as their creator. It's right there. Uh, look at the Ten Commandments. Actually, the Fourth Commandment has more words than any of the other commandments and starts with the word remember. Mm -hmm. I go now to Psalm 95, verse 6. The Bible says, O come. Let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. Don't kneel before any man. Don't kneel before any entity. We must kneel before the Lord, our God, our maker, because he is our creator. Mm -hmm. in, uh, now we move to Revelation 13 really quick. And we begin in verse 13. Notice some of the things that take place here. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. You know, people uh, look at this and wait a minute, this must, this must be a God. He's making fire come down from heaven. And you see the same thing taking place in the book of Job when you see that the devil causes uh, fire to come down and they say the fire of God has come down. Mm -hmm. But it is because God has given permission to the devil to, to, uh, to create this havoc and this, uh, these terrible calamities upon Job. And people think that God is doing it, but it is the devil causing these things. And notice what it says in verse 14. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. So be careful with signs and wonders. They don't all come from God. The devil, the devil has some capability to do some things. Verse 15, he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Mm -hmm. Here we have another threatening. Uh, if you don't worship the beast, you're going to be killed. So what are most people going to do? They're going to bow down and worship the beast. Mm -hmm. And you notice, of course, in Revelation 13, you have this saying that the whole world wondered after the beast. They are in admiration. Even John, uh, he, and I wondered, and he, he's also amazed. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, and so uh, we need to be careful. We need to uh, worship God, our creator. And now we go to verse 16 and 17. Notice carefully here. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave to receive a mark on their right hand or, in, or on their foreheads and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So the time is coming closer and closer that this is coming upon us and we need to make a decision who we are going to worship. Mm -hmm. Now, some of the people will worship the beast because they really believe. They are deceived. They believe that, oh, I'm going to worship because uh, I believe all of this. But some people, it's because of the economic situation going on. Wait a minute. If I don't do this, I'm not going to be able to work. I'm not going to be able to get paid. I'm not going to be able to put food upon my table. And it is, they just go along with it. They go along with the crowd. They go along with the plan because... It's convenient for them. But you know, in the time of the end, you need to look at, it's not always going to be convenient. It's not always going to be popular to worship our creator. Mm -hmm. And everyone has to make a decision who they are going yeah. to worship. Yeah. I encourage you to worship the creator. He loves you. He made a great plan of salvation to rescue you from destruction, and he's inviting you to be a part of his great family. What happens to those that choose the Lord, choose to worship him? They live forever and ever and ever. No suffering, no pain. This trouble that is coming, 
It will go, it will, it will, it will come to pass and be gone and we will live eternally on this earth, happy and peaced throughout eternity. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Dinsey. I want to accept the invitation Amen. right now. My name is Daniel. God is my judge, Aaron. <laughs> and I have Wednesday's lesson, which is the early and latter rain. Maybe you have heard the term, the latter rain, and it sounded like technical jargon or something confusing that didn't really make sense. You didn't get a good explanation, or perhaps you've heard it so, for so many years and it's just kind of another one of those issues on the shelf, or perhaps you've never heard of the latter rain before, going through Walmart, going through the store. Nobody talks about the latter rain. You don't find that on a shelf. So whatever your situation is, I want to claim God's promise right now that he will teach us. And so I'm going to summarize actually what I've recently recently read in a little book that we have called Last Day Events. You might have a red copy or a blue copy or a paperback copy, or you can get it online. And it, there's a chapter in there that is called The Latter Rain. 14 short pages, pages 183 to 196. It's chapter 13, and it's filled with choice statements that lift up and exalt some of the things of scripture that we maybe have not thought about or understood before. So I'm gonna share with you kind of what comes from God's word and what I've read recently in this chapter. So what is the early rain? What is the latter rain? It's actually a grain farming metaphor that you find in both the Old and New Testament. I'll give you one text, though there's others I could share as well. Joel 2, 23 and 24. Rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain. That's the early rain, former, early, faithfully, and he will cause the rain to come down for you, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. And both of those rains together help produce a crop. We find this also in the New Testament in James chapter 5, 7 and 8, where it says, See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. So the early rain, physical metaphor here, is what causes the seed that has been sown to germinate and begin to grow. Now the latter rain then takes that seed that is already growing and, and producing grain and it causes it to mature for the purpose of being ready for the harvest at the appropriate harvest time. So here's the picture from the crop. You're not gonna have a crop unless you have both the early rain and the latter rain. If there's no early rain, then there's gonna be no growth uh, of the grain that can mature. And if there's no latter grain, then any growth that already has occurred will not mature into a crop. So that's the simple picture here, and it symbolically represents this. The rain represents the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Amen. Nothing grows. The grain is not going to grow without, uh, without rain, and nothing grows spiritually. There's going to be no development of character without the Holy Spirit working on us. Nothing. Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6, says it so clearly here. So he answered and said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, that's human might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. This is God's testimony right here, that the Holy Spirit's work is not just important, it is absolutely essential and mandatory. No human involvement here is going to bring about this character growth. We can certainly participate, but it's, it's the Holy Spirit's work. Now there's two applications that I like to make here. One of them is the individual application. The early rain is the work of the Holy Spirit in your life that begins to bring about spiritual growth. The early rain uh, is, is falling on the lives of every people. The Holy Spirit is involved with communicating, motivating, prompting, pushing every individual, and it gives us the benefit of God's day-by-day -day guidance in our lives. But it is our choice whether or not we want to accept or respond to that. Now there's a metaphor that actually is used throughout scripture of a vessel. We find that in last day events, page 194, where it is written that we need to keep our vessel clean and right side up to receive the Holy Spirit. Now, if you're listening, I'm holding an empty cup in my hand. I'm going to flip it upside down here and just picture me taking a pitcher of water and pouring it now over my upside down cup. 
the water, the, the, it'll be poured out, but nothing will be accumulated inside. We can actually do that in our spiritual lives, have the Holy Spirit poured out on us, but we are unwilling to respond, unwilling to receive, and we've turned ourselves upside down. Now, the latter rain is the work of the Holy Spirit that will bring you to maturity, ripened for harvest. Here's the thing, we, we cannot as Christians say, oh, I'm, I'm not gonna receive the early rain of the ladder of, of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and we, we don't respond to God's prompting now, who's communicating with us in our heart, guiding us to repent, to love one another, to obey God's commands and expect that there's going to be a final experience that is going to somehow undo all the decisions that we've made. That's going to change our habits and our desires and miraculously make us at that point submit to God's will, which we've never submitted to in the past. So that's the, that's the individual application. We need the Holy Spirit day by day, but then the outpouring at the final end of time is going to bring about maturity we can't bring about on our own. Now, a second application is the prophetic experience. In Acts chapter one, uh, Christians have gathered together in loving unity and they are praying for the Holy Spirit as they were instructed in Acts one, one to four to eight, and in Luke 11, nine to 13. And so the Holy Spirit is poured out in power and they begin speaking in tongues, sharing the gospel, communicating in languages people understand the gospel message. And Peter looks at this and he says that this is under inspiration. Peter in Acts chapter 2, 16 and 18 says this fulfills God's promise in Joel 2 verses 28 and 29. It shall come, a pat to, shall, shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And this then is the early reign where God was pouring out his spirit. But the crop was not harvested at that time. Jesus tells us in Matthew 13, 39, that the harvest is going to be not at the beginning, but at the end of the age. And so on the farm, the latter rain comes right before the harvest of the crop and the same will be true when Jesus comes. So before Jesus returns, while sinful people are demonstrating the unholy spirit, that they have allowed to motivate and prompt their lives, the Holy Spirit, the, the real Holy Spirit will be poured out in abundance on those who have already accepted the individual work that the Holy Spirit offers to us. Great Controversy, page 611, paragraph three. The great work of the gospel is not to close with less manifestation of the power of God than marked its opening. The prophecies which were fulfilled in the outpouring of the former rain at the opening of the gospel are again to be fulfilled in the latter rain at its close. Simply put, the, whole, the work of the Holy Spirit will bring full light to those who will accept it and the power to live up to that full light. This produces a mature harvest of righteousness by faith. So. How do we receive the Holy Spirit? We've got to ask That's right. individually and collectively. We have to be asking. Zechariah 10.1 says, ask the Lord for rain mm -hmm. in the time of the latter rain. The Lord will make flashing clouds. He will give them showers of rain, grass in the fields for everyone. Is your church asking? Is your church praying? Are you individually as families, as husband and wife, if you're united in the faith, are you asking for the Holy Spirit and keeping your cup right side up saying, Lord, I'm gonna listen for that prompting, that voice when it's in agreement with your word in scripture that I know to be true and I'm not gonna wait, I'm gonna be obedient to that. We can focus on all sorts of other things, potlucks and parking lots and potted plants and programs, but are we asking for the Holy Spirit? Christ Object Lessons, chapter one, sorry, page 121 says, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost was the former rain, but the latter rain will be more abundant. More yes. abundant. Amen. The Spirit awaits our demand and reception. Christ is again to be revealed in His fullness by the Holy Spirit's power. And I want to share with you just a couple of statements from this book. I, I noted all sorts, but I just want to say, read a few. We should pray as earnestly for the descent of the Holy Spirit as the disciples prayed on the day of Pentecost. If they needed it at that time, we need it more today.
Or how about this one here? There is nothing that Satan fears so much as that the people of God shall clear the way by removing every hindrance so that the Lord can pour out his spirit upon a languishing church. Satan is terrified that you will ask for the Holy Spirit, that you as a church will unite and he's gonna try to do everything to keep your mind engaged with something else, praying for little things when God has given you the power of the Holy Spirit. Ask for this, he says, and I will give it to you. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Daniel. Each one of you, what a great lesson. I want my cup to be right side up. Mm -hmm. Oh, I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Powerful. Thursday, we look at the loud cry, and I'm Jill Morricone. On Thursday, really, we're looking at that louder, ladder rain being poured out and God's people proclaiming Earth's final message, the final warning call to his people throughout the world. The preface, and then we're going to Revelation 18, but the preface is Matthew 24, 14, and we quote this scripture kind of often here at 3ABN. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. God wants his people, his people filled with the latter rain, filled with the Holy Spirit, to spread this gospel message to the entire world. Mm -hmm. We look at this loud cry, which I call Earth's final warning or heaven's final warning to Earth is probably a better way to look at it. It's really the reiteration of the second angel's message united with the third angel's message swells to make that final warning to the world. And it's a call. Babylon is imminently going to be destroyed or it's going to be destroyed right away. And it's a call for God's people to come out of Babylon before it's too late. So let's look at Revelation 18. Revelation chapter 18, we'll look at the first few verses and we have a couple takeaways from those verses. Revelation 18 verse one. After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority. Now let's stop here. It's another angel. Remember in Revelation 14, we had the three angels, angels being God's messengers. In other words, this loud cry, this last message to be given is to be given by you and me. It's to be given by God's people. We are to share this message. God's people, as Ryan talked about, who are loyal to the truth and stand on the truth. God's people, as Pastor James talked about, who are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. God's people who are anointed with the latter rain and ready to go forward with this message. Uh, his people, the angel, has great authority, exousia, power to act, authority. Now the lesson had this, I love this about that word exousia. It says it often refers to Christ's triumph over the principalities and powers of hell. It's the same word that Jesus uses in Matthew 28, verse 20. All power, all exousia is given to me in heaven and on earth. In other words, Jesus sends his followers forth with power. So we, the angel, we are to proclaim as God's messengers this message, having great authority, that authority comes from God. And what does it say? The earth will be illuminated with his glory. It reminds me of Habakkuk chapter two, verse 14. Now this is of course talking about, if you look at it in context, about Babylon in all its splendor and power, how it's actually headed for destruction if you look at it in Habakkuk. But Habakkuk 2:14 says this, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Daniel talked about the early rain prophetically being given uh, in the Pentecostal time. This would be Acts chapter two, Peter's sermon and subsequently there in Acts. 
the gospel at that time, it went like wildfire, did it not? Mm -hmm. Under Holy Spirit power mm -hmm. and anointing. In fact, in Acts chapter 17, verse six, it says, when they did not find them, this is referring to Paul and Silas, they dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, these people have turned the world upside down and they come here too. In other words, that early rain power, the Holy Spirit anointing had enabled mere men and women to turn the world upside down for Christ. And Paul also says in Colossians 1 23, that the gospel, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. In other words, we see that the gospel went to the then known world, there under the anointing of the Holy Spirit with the early rain. Then we see the latter rain right here at the end of time will be poured out. Daniel read um, from Great Controversy, page 611, which I had here, which we're not gonna read, but I wanna read page 612. This is talking about the latter rain. It says, servants of God with their faces lighted up and shining with holy consecration will hasten from place to place to proclaim the message from heaven. This is the last great warning message by thousands of voices all over the world. The warning will be given. Miracles will be wrought. The sick will be healed and signs and wonders will follow the believers. Praise the Lord for the latter rain. Takeaway number one, the Holy Spirit empowers God's people to give his message. Mm -hmm. This message, the loud cry, Revelation chapter 18, only the infilling, the anointing of the Holy Spirit with his people individually and corporately will enable any of us to give this morning message. Now, what is that message? Verse two, we're in Revelation 18, verse two. He, God's people, cried mightily with a loud voice saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. This is that reminiscent of the second angel's message. And has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. Now it's interesting to me that Babylon is the people who claim to be God's people. Mm -hmm. Is that not people in Babylon thinking they're serving God, thinking they're following him, thinking they're Christians and they're following him along? And yet, to me, this description of demons being there and every foul spirit being there and a cage for every unclean and hated bird, wow. And yet God has people in this system. We're going to see that. Babylon is the dwelling place of demons. It indicates the spiritualism that's rampant at the end times. Now, John, the revelator here in Revelation, uses similar language to both Isaiah and Jeremiah when they describe the fall of Babylon, ancient Babylon, that is. In Isaiah 13, verses 19 and 20, it says, In Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldeans' pride will be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. It will never be inhabited, nor will it be settled from generation to generation. Now, of course, that's talking about ancient Babylon. But this fall of uh, Babylon will be just as irrevocable and final. In fact, that's takeaway number two. Babylon's fate is irrevocably sealed. It's not like when Jonah went to Nineveh and the people repented and God said, okay, well, I'm gonna forgive you and you get a second chance. No, at this point in earth's history, Babylon's fate is irrevocably sealed. Mm -hmm. In Revelation 18, Babylon is a reign before the Lord on five counts. Pride and arrogance, materialism and luxury, adultery, immorality, deception, unbiblical doctrines and traditions, and persecution. It has reached its full cup of iniquity and judgment is about ready to fall. Now, when we say Babylon's fate is irrevocably sealed, that does not apply to the people inside of Babylon. We will see this. Verse three, all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth committed fornication with her and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. We see Babylon is judged and charged on religious, political, and economic grounds. The religious, the wine of her wrath, we see false doctrines. The political, we see the fornication with the kings of the earth as union of church and state power. Then we see the merchants of the earth. This is economic charges. Babylon has seduced almost the entire 
world. But what's verse 4? I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people. This is the clarion call. Come out of her, lest you share in her sins and lest you receive of her plagues. God has people in Babylon. God will have people in Babylon at the very last moment. And it is our responsibility under the unction and anointing of the Holy Spirit to call them, to give them the last warning message and say, before it is forever too late, come out of her, my people, make a choice to follow the Lord Jesus. Make a choice to follow the truth in the word of God. Make a choice that when Jesus comes again, you can look up with joy and say, this is my God. I have waited for him and he has come to save me. Mm, amen, praise God. This was a great lesson, great Bible prophecy lessons. Let's get some final thoughts from our panelists. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 29, 30, and no, 30, 32. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed unto the day of, of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor, all evil speaking be put away from you and all malice, and be kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. The seal of God is about forgiveness and putting away all of that malice and evil speaking. Mm, amen. Matthew chapter 15, verse eight and nine. Listen carefully, please. These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. There are people in churches that are, they think they're worshiping God, but they're observing teachings and doctrines of men. Look at your doctrines, and if they're not in the Bible, you need to leave. Mm. I just want to remind us that the, the deceiver counterfeits everything good, even the latter rain. And so there will be a burst of emotion and supernatural power and great music, but it will be devoid of a love for the truth and obedience to the word of God. So keep your eyes on truth and the word of God. Hosea 2.23 to me in a special sense applies to those people who God calls out of Babylon. I would say to those who are not my people, you are my people. And they shall say, you are my God. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Jesus said uh, that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And of course, Paul writes in 2 Timothy 2.15 that we should study to show ourselves approved. Uh, a workman needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Let's get in the word, my friends. It's, we don't have a lot of time left. We should know the word of God and have it hid in our hearts that we might not sin against him in these last days. Join us next week for our final lesson, lesson number 13, entitled The Triumph of God's Love. <laughs>